Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and good golly, Miss Molly. Welcome to another episode of It's Only Talk and Roll, the show that, that celebrates the incredible talent and timeless artistry, I wrote those words very carefully, of the music legends we love. Uh, I am your host, that 70s rock fan, and today my road crew and I embark on a journey through the world of a gentleman who has been at the heart of rock history with... The Beatles, my favorite band of all time. Um, I'm not unusual in that, of course. <laughs> it doesn't make me unusual. Uh, but also many, many other acts like the Stones, Derek and the Dominoes. We saw Judas Priest, Motorhead, and a ton of other great acts. So what a life indeed. So grab a seat, turn up the volume, and get ready to join us on this extraordinary ride as we celebrate the career of the great Mr. Kevin Harrington. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you very much. Woo! Woo it's great to have you here, sir. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are so excited about this. I, I've got my Sergeant Pepper hat on. Um, hey, Justin, just to let you know, you're sitting on top of me and it looks like you're kneeling. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's the way. <laughs> Carry on. Carry on. That's the way it works out with these. We can move them around, but uh, we'll put no, them in. It's, it's good. I I'll it. let, you, let you on the top, but yeah, welcome indeed, Kevin. Thank you very much for joining us. I know it's later over in the UK in terms of time, um, so we do appreciate that very much. Uh, how are you doing, though? How's life treating you? It's, um, it's all right. You know, it's quiet. It's, you know, it's retired it's yeah, yeah it's not too bad not too shabby good sir no, good to hear breath, that's for sure yeah well we're definitely going to be taking a walk through some of those marvelous marvelous uh, <laughs> stories and memories you've got uh i'm so excited because as i say with the beatles i'm a lifelong beatles fan i've got boxes full of beatles memorabilia the posters all up in the world on this side i've got my who mm. stuff behind me there but uh, uh well, but also a mystery tour Magical Mystery Tour, yeah. I just, I've, yeah. Uh, but um, I'd also just before we get started, I'd like to say hello to uh, my wonderful road crew and the panel. How are you all today, folks? Doing good. Doing great. Doing wonderful. Yeah. I'm older now, but you know, 
Yeah, cool. No, I'm glad you could join me, and obviously uh, feel free to chip in at any time with with questions for Kevin and uh, those who have got the control, like John, can flip comments up on the screen and stream, and we'll uh, we'll keep in touch with the chat. So welcome everybody in the chat here on YouTube. We're also live over on Rumble, uh, climbing up the uh, the live uh, the page where they show who's on, and we're climbing up that as we go. Uh, if you'll, you know, please everybody in the chat, leave a like uh, and share the stream out uh, so we get as many eyeballs as possible on this great guest. Um, yeah, so Kevin. Yes. That's you, that is you. I'd like to start off just by plugging and talking about a wonderful book that I've read that, that you wrote called Who's the Redhead on the Roof? my uh was it my life with the beatles or my story? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um great book everybody you can get it on on kindle and uh, kobo and other online book uh services fantastic focused on your early life and your times with the beatles um I wondered, actually, Kevin, are you going to be writing a follow-up about the rest of your career? Because it's really oh, good. Um, I'll, I'll start with this. That, what you're looking at now, is round about 9,000 words or something. Yeah. Uh, well, that is the beginning of what I had... Um, let's, let's call it a manuscript, for want of a better word, which is actually last count was about 48,000 words um, okay. and um, the reason that's as it is is because in 2002 or something Mark Lewison got in touch with me um, who's the Beatles well the Chronicle the man that chronicles the Beatles. Basically. Oh, Mark Lewison, yeah, he's the he's the real go-to guy. Yeah, he certainly is. If you want to know anything, <laughs> good lord, good lord, go to that man because it's quite phenomenal. I saw him the other night. Oh, but anyway, I'm getting back to that. Um, and what I discovered in over a period of about four or five years, I was kind of um, my, let me see, my wife. After that interview with Mark, my wife, when she was working, decided to Google my name in the Beatles. Uh, because I'd just, uh, it's just, you know, that was something that was just gone. So, and a few articles came up where I was described as uh, a lackey, mm. uh, an office staffer, an Apple office staffer. Um, and yeah, it was just kind of, it, to me, it was ignorance. Mm. So rather than, because I'm not a writer. If you read the book, you'll realize I'm not a writer. What that is, is just me sitting in a shed with a tape machine and just... Just recurring the story. Like to, you know, and then my wife, you know, types it all out. And I just thought, I've got to do something about this because I, if you like, I, I think I deserve a little bit more than being called a lackey. Yeah. Because you don't do what I did by being a lackey, which is another story. So I just decided, right, I've got this. Let's just let's just put it out, you know, and just just tell people what I did, basically, yeah. just, okay, just to try and say, hey. I'm not a lackey. I wasn't a lackey. Yeah, you were, their equipment. Yeah, you were in the room when some of the most momentous Beatles recordings were made and some of the, the, the biggest moments in, in rock history. Yeah. Uh, and there wasn't many people in that room. Um, obviously, you held a position, let's say, roadie or equipment roadie, the only two other guys had ever heard held me, Neil Aspinall and Mal Evans. Yeah, there's only the three of you can ever claim that. So it was a privilege to be where I was because you don't walk in, you are invited in to that, that scenario. 
You know, nobody can just walk into a Beatles recording. You have to be invited in. And to do three mm -hmm. albums was kind of uh, very, very special. Absolutely, mate. We're looking forward to hearing about some of those stories, and, and I do hope that you're you're not tired of ever recounting those stories because we're going to be asking you. To... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's few and far between. So you know, but what I'm worried about is that um, as as the years get on, maybe I'm going to forget a few things. So <sighs> we'll just ask Mark Lewis, and he'll tell us the answer. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like he knows more about everyone involved than, than they do themselves. I mean, I'm Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. He does. You know, there's no getting away from it. Yeah. And for those who don't know who Mark Lewison is, he's the guy that wrote, certainly he was instrumental in anthology, in the anthology series, but he wrote the complete Beatles recordings book, uh, amongst other books he's written about the Beatles, which to me is the definitive rock history book the day-by-day -day account of every recording session they ever did and all the great progressions that they made because of that. And, and obviously from the, I guess, the White Album onwards, you were there for all of that recording. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's quite the story, sir. So what I would like to do with your uh, permission, though, is I'll have to go back to the, to the start uh, of... Of things, and you were you're a real genuine Londoner. Maybe uh, I guess it, you're not an East Ender, you're a West Ender. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So you were you were born and brought up. You were literally born in Montague Street, around the corner from the British Museum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty five. Wow. Well, well done, Brian. Well done. That's, that's the one. That's right a nice there. place. It's pretty it's, smart. It was council, by the way. Yeah, so these at the time, as you say, were council-owned houses. They were what were called council houses in the UK. Yeah, so See that basement, the basement where I live used oh. to have concrete flooring. Yeah, and we were so poor that all of that over the space of five, six years, all the park, all the parquet floor got burnt. Oh, so, so, so what, would, would, what would be the equivalent of council housing in the United States? Like Section Eight housing? Community housing, maybe? I don't community, know. Yeah, it's more like kind of community housing. It's not really, uh, it would be wrong to describe it as poor because it was not, although some areas that had council housing were pretty rough. It was more that because home ownership wasn't that wide after the war in Britain, the, the, the community councils, the town councils and city councils took it upon themselves to build a lot of housing and then rent it out to people. Like the projects? Yeah, kind of, except yeah. you know, if you look at this, I mean, now these are expensive. Oh, oh. Like, Aren't they just? Oh. Yeah, hotels and, and it'd be millions to buy even one part of one of these now. But so you were you in the basement or no, we were on the we were on the ground floor. Right. I was actually born in just on the other side of that room. Yeah. We and we didn't have that tree in front of our house. Yeah. Or was we have the British Museum. Yeah, around the corner is the British Museum. It's actually a really incredible area to walk around. I've walked, I've probably walked down the street in the past, uh, walking around in London. I spent a lot of time there. And it's a beautiful area. And there's, it's so close to the city of London and many other things. The West uh, End. The West End, yeah. I mean, that, that was... I mean, that must have been a fairly good childhood and growing up in that area, I would have thought. Um, they were happy times, but I think as most kids, whether you're poor or rich, certainly, you know, you don't notice the poverty. You don't notice that your family don't have money. Mm. The only reason I know that we were poor was because many, many years later, uh, my wonderful um, old... Uh, youth club leader just actually just said, you know, Kevin, you were really poor when you were young. <laughs> then it was uh, <laughs> never noticed. <laughs> you know, no, yeah, that's right, never noticed. Hugh, Ed, uh, Hugh Webster. Uh, yeah. Wonderful man. Wonderful man. Um yeah, so you know, but we had built you know, we had building sites and bomb bomb sites. That's what we played. If you go to the right of that that sort of street just further down. Mm. There's now sort of like Bloomsbury Square, uh, which is a little square. 
that was a bomb site and we used to play in that so you know yeah i mean i remember even as a kid i was a kid in the 60s i'm a little bit behind you not too far but there were still lots of bomb sites in the uk and, and even where i lived up in edinburgh that had been bombed a few times there was there was a few and it was a common thing you know was yeah, like, I tell you, another thing i remember is yet again just just to the right of that building is um whatever street it was um i had a friend that lived there right and in these flats again they had gas lighting and oh, i remember oh, lighting. Right. you know so hey it's it go back a bit that's quite <laughs> incredible if you think about it i mean uh, it's, it's almost victorian yeah yeah. So, so growing, I mean, when you were growing up, um, were w did you get into music pretty early? Oh. Were you no? No, my earliest musical stuff I think was when we moved away from there to somewhere else. And my uh, brother Brian was a great music fan, and okay. he he kind of was into Eddie Cocker and and all of that stuff. So that's where originally my musical thing came from mm. you know, I uh, my biggest fan at the day was um lonnie donegan oh i remember lonnie uh, uh yeah. rock island lane and put yeah. on the style the, the first record that i ever bought and i still can't remember the, the name of it now it's down by the mission san miguel to the great house yeah the dwell don carlos and i can't remember the name of it yeah, I know the one you mean. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, very good. Good. <laughs> Is that like a seven-inch single? Yeah. 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 But that's, that's really you know that's, but it was mainly you know American stuff because that's what my brother Brian sort of played. Yeah, I think a lot of us was he your older brother? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. a lot of us got stuff from our older siblings. Yeah, that was just, it's just a common story, but. So growing up there and you were at school and you, you were looking, you'd done various jobs. And then uh, once, a, I think, I believe, according to your book, you saw an advert in the evening standard for NEMS, which was North yeah, End. Was Brian, funny enough, Brian turned me on to that because Brian knew, you know, uh, sort of the music. Yeah, he was into his music and stuff and, See, I had one brother that was a rocker, yeah, and one brother that was a mod. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> so um, Brian, who was the mod, you know, he'd he'd sort of he used to iron the creases into his jeans, you know, oh. and, and all of that stuff. And I'm serious, serious, and uh, yeah. So he, because I sort of said I was working with my elder brother. Yeah. from uh, Mick on the building sites. Mm. This was in the winter and it was like... Yeah. Maybe about 15, 14 or 15. I even. was 15 then. Yeah. And I was an, uh, an electrician's mate and just really building sites in the winter in those days with no health and safety. Oh, yeah. You know, um, there's some stories there. <laughs> because uh, he used to work with Monk. But anyway, um, I, I just said, you know, I've just fed up with this. And he says, I'll find you a job, Kevin. Open the standard, and he went, there you go. Names Enterprises, Office Boy. Office Boy, okay. And Names was, was did you know at the time that was Brian Epstein and Beatles? No, Brian, no, but Brian did. Right, he knew, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's that. My screen has just gone dark. We can, we can see you okay, sir. Um, yeah, um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and he said, you know, okay, this is Brian Epstein's firm and, you know, the Beatles. You've just gone off. I don't know what. Mick. Yeah, you've. Uh, we we can see and hear you, sir. Can you hear us? No, I I, I can hear you. I just can't see you now. Okay, no problem. Are you no on worries. a laptop? Uh, yeah, Mac. But are you plugged you... in? Hang on a second. I'm having to get my. Producer. Yeah, we'll give you a second or two. Yeah, no, take your time, mate. No, no hurry. No if, hurry. If he's unplugged, sometimes when the battery's going low, it'll go into like a no, battery it's, saver it's, mode. Yeah. No, it's plugged in. It's all. It's probably just a temporary fluctuation, uh, fluctuation in internet streaming. <laughs> so we'll get the the producer, the technical producer at the at Kevin's end is going to help us out. Um, okay. Well, I think she's uh, she's asleep in bed, so we can just I'll just do this. Um, 
Ah, you, there you go. There you go. Yeah, you just you just froze it for a minute. So I just have to press the button. So we can still yeah, see I, you. I just had to press a button. Okay, well, well. With all these years of roadie equipment experience, you see, you should. I, I, no, 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 no. No, I realised I didn't like being a roadie when it was all technical. Yeah, I, it was. It was no, that was. Um, no, I was not a really good roadie, to be honest. So, so you, so you answered the advert for NEMS Office Boy, and you were interviewed by Peter Brown, I believe. Yeah. I'm not saying. Um, and you got the job, so the job. kind of a whole new world for you. Very 1966. Oh, hello. Here's you at one of the NEMS parties. I think you could only have been about 16 or 17 here. You're probably getting a hammer. <laughs> yeah. That would be 16. 16 years old. You're at an NEMS office party, and you were working as a kind of a runner, in a sense. Uh, well, office boy you know it was basically you know what an office boy does um i, I think you call them juniors over in america or whatever or mm. girlfriend he's just delivering letters doing the mail you know just generally running around and there was well there was two other office boys so there was three of us um both called steve one <laughs> was, yeah one was um Brian Epstein's personal office boy. Mm -hmm. uh, the other guy was just like me, just a, a regular office boy, and but he was a semi-pro musician. So you know. Um, so yeah. I guess you weren't getting too. At this point, you were still pretty new. You didn't. You weren't getting too close to the hierarchy, such as Brian. I would. I wouldn't imagine. But oh, uh, no, no, no. I was. No, I. I was kind of dealing with. Um, oh. You know, like the agents and Tony Barrow, uh, you know, and just the general. Yeah. I guess bands were coming in and out of the, the offices all the time, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All of all of um, NEMS's, like, yeah, which was what? Billy J. Kramer and Dakota's. Jerry, Jerry and the Peacemakers. Almost. Uh, Paddy Thousand Gibson. So, uh, Scylla Black, I think, at one point you, you mentioned you were. Yeah. No, she. No, you see, Brian. Or, uh, Mr. Epstein's office dealt with Stiller and the Beatles. He had yeah. a separate office. Now you can see Mr. Epstein had Hill Street or Hill House was his private office. Then he had an office at his house, which was run by uh, Joanne. I can't remember her name. Yeah. Um, and so, and then there was NEMS, which was the main one, which was for all of the other acts. That's where all the agents were, and, right. right? And like the accounts, and well, whatever else, you know, the production office, press office. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, I mean, gradually the other guys dropped out, and you became more the main office boy, as it were. And yeah, I yeah. Once the two Steves left, then if you like, I was elevated to Mr. Epstein's personal office boy. Yeah, so you got the gig working directly for Brian, who's... Yeah. And, yeah. and I've often wondered, I mean, he was a young guy. He wasn't that he, that he was a particularly old guy, but he was running this empire. Did he always seem pretty confident and in command to you when you, you knew him? Well, when, when you're an office boy, um, the boss always seems in command. Right. I you guess. Know, um, and so you you just have the utmost respect for for him. I mean, the first time I ever saw him was I had to I was instructed to meet him at a small theatre just off of the West End. So this would be seven, uh, 67. Yeah, I think it would be. Um, and yeah, I sort of just went to this little theatre and was waiting and waiting, and then I heard. Because a theatre reception in those days, was it was very quiet, you know. And so I just hid in the shadows, you know, not knowing what to do. And I heard him come down the stairs and he just said, where's the boy? Oh, the boy. The boy. <laughs> so I stepped forward and said, you know, very tenderly, hey, Mr. Epstein, here I am. You know, and yeah, I think it was, it could have been a letter, you know, to the grade or somebody like that. It was quite yeah. a sort of contract type letter. So 
But mind you, all the stuff that I ever did for them was quite quite important. So. Yeah, would you? I mean, he didn't even, even though he was from Liverpool, he had no trace of a Liverpool accent, did he? No, like, nor, did, nor did Peter Brown. No. But most of them didn't, funnily enough. Because uh, yeah. NEMS was almost starved, and it seemed to me at the time, by Liverpudlians. Where in actual fact, there was maybe half a dozen or so, you know, true Liverpudlians like Laurie McCaffrey, the receptionist, bless her, uh, mm. Tony Bramwell, um, Peter Brown, Derek Taylor, not the press officer Derek Taylor, but the other Derek Taylor. The other Derek Taylor. Yeah. You know, and they all kind of, they got rid of their accents. Yeah, they were all upper middle class guys, I guess, a lot of them. Uh, grammar school boys. I, I assume so. Or yeah. So maybe. Peter Br Peter Brown, of course, gets famously gets a mention in um, Ballad of John and Yoko. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the lyrics of that, but he. Yeah. So the Beatles did have a crew around them. They'd been with them for a long time. Oh, yes. guy, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah. No, I was just going to say yes. I was just agreeing. Yeah, they. Yeah. You know, they had. You know, there was. You know, like Derek Taylor was. Um, from what I can gather, he was. He was like Mr. Fix It. Yeah. You know, all the Beatles for, for Mr. Epstein. Yeah, and this at this point, I guess, because you were working directly for Brian, you would start to have some contact with the lads, as he called them, um, delivering the stuff to them and so on. The boys. Um, no, funnily enough, it was... Um, it was Scylla was the, the first one I kind of met... The, yeah. the, the Beatles were still somewhere else. A rarefied like. atmosphere somewhere else, yeah. Like with Mr. Epstein's office in Hill House. Okay. It was too small. It was basically one office. No, sorry, two offices. One where um, Wendy Hanson, had, who was Mr. Epstein's assistant, um, had her office, and there was Mr. Epstein's office, and there was the reception. So I always knew something was happening when Mr. Epstein's door was closed. When it was mm. open, I knew nobody was in. <laughs> you know, <That's> right. <laughs> you know so, and then but, so I'd walk in and uh, I don't remember her name, bless her. The receptionist would go, shh. And yeah. so, you know, yeah. I would tone it down. Yeah, and so so things were getting exciting at NEMS by that time, though, because Robert Stigwood came on board. And yes. we brought the Bee Gees and Cream and other acts with him. Yeah. So you were you were seeing a lot of rock royalty around. Jimi Hendrix, I think you first saw at that time as well. At, at, at the Savile. At the Savile Theatre, which Brian Epstein, I think, oh, did he own it or rent it? I can't remember. No, he owned it. He owned it. And then yeah. during the week, there'd be like a regular show or whatever. You know, I can't remember, you know. And then on a Sunday when it was empty, that's when he had decided to have the rock concerts. So you got involved in those, I guess. Well, yeah. I, you see, I by that time, I think I'd been an office boy for about 18 months or so. Yeah. And I decided I'd had enough. And so I told uh, Peter Brown that I was, you know, quitting and everything else. And um, one morning at Mr. Epstein's house in Chapel Street, he, uh, we met on the stairs and he said, ah, oh, Kevin, I... I hear you want to leave us. And I said, yeah. He said, well, don't do that. Look around the office and see if there's any department that you want to join. And the only thing I really sort of seemed kind of exciting was the NEMS production office. Hmm. You see, I, um, NEMS production put on Silla's show at like the, the, Sab the Sabble Theatre. Uh, yeah, the the Boy Hotel. Oh, yeah. The Boy Hotel, right? Because she's sort of cabaret. So um, I would go to these sort of shows a lot, just delivering stuff. And that's where I met sort of Vivian Moynihan, who was head of productions. Um, and Tony was also in the production side. Tony Bramwell. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was, he was basically, he was running the saddle on behalf of Brian. You know, he was Mr. Epstein. He was running the shows basically and um i decided yeah i i think i think the production so it was agreed that i'd join the production side but vivian moynihan didn't really need anybody but so 
it was decided that I would be her assistant, which mm. meant that I would have to learn to type. Right. <laughs> it's uh, fa yeah. fascinating when you think, Kevin, that in those days, unlike now, when you need a, a master's degree to serve fries, that then you, <laughs> anybody could really, through just working, get into these great jobs, you know? Well, I, I, I've got a feeling it, it's, it's still sometimes, you know, it's what you do, it's where you are, and it's how you come across. Yeah. You know, any assistant from any organization can be, you know, elevated to, if they're good enough, you know, I suppose elevated to any job. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I must have to be at the right place. And unfortunately, I had to learn to type and, uh, as I said, sort of do long, do shorthand. So I joined, um, there was a, you know, a secretarial school. And I can't remember, but <laughs> and a week before I was actually due to start, I thought, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be sitting on somebody's knee, you know, just doing shorthand and then. Well, it depends who she is, Kevin. I mean, it depends whose knee she was. <laughs> you know, but and then, uh, yeah. well, well, in those days, anybody's knee would have frightened the life out of me. Um, so I just got. So he said, okay, right, you're going to come down to the Savile on Sundays because we're starting these shows and you can sort of help. And yeah, and you saw, so you got bands like Cream and Hendrix played there when you were working there. I mean, lots yeah. of big bands would play at those yeah. gigs. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. I mean, did you get the feeling you were at the epicenter of something? No. Uh, that, huh? No, it was, to me, it was just... You know, it's difficult to explain to people what I was feeling. I mean, I'm, I know I was excited. I'm sure of that. You know, got to remember yeah. this is 60 years, or 60, 58 years ago. You know. I know I was excited. You know, um, couldn't fail not to be. But it was, by that time, it was just a job. It was just something, just something that was, you know. Just, you get on with it. Yeah, you get on with it. But what, for me, you see, what was really exciting was working on a Sunday. Yeah. One of the joys of NEMS was that they worked, They opened on a Saturday morning. Mm. Now, all through the week, you're wearing a suit. But on a Saturday morning, because I was w lived nearest to the office, which was in Oxford, Oxford Circus, I always got the Saturday morning gig, which was fine because, one, it was overtime. But, two, there was just this thing of being out of the normal. Yeah, yeah, well, sure is. Yeah, and that's what the saddle was. It was out of the normal. Mm. But also, you knew you, you weren't in the normal when all these bands would come in. You know, I mean, it's it's like the first time I saw all of these bands, I was like, oh, they were on the telly, whoa. Yeah, these Cream, guys. Hendrix, I guess the bands like The Who played there and, and other. Yeah, you know, Big bands, the American yeah. acts. Yeah, that's Domino. You know, yeah, I mean, that's Domino. Playing his piano away and then going, Poof! and the piano moving, he's playing away and he's going, Poof! and this wow. piano moved across the stage and, Poof! you know, did, did, did. <laughs> it was it was pretty, it was pretty you know? cool, mate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So those were fun times. You even appeared, you even appeared in the Bonzo Dog Duda Band's act, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I got that gig. You had, to throw, you had to insult them from a, a, a gallery, from the gallery, and then they would pretend to throw you off the. Yeah, the Tony Hamill said, "Hey, we uh, need somebody uh, during this show, and you're not doing anything because I didn't do anything during the show, right? You've just volunteered. This is what you've got to do. You've got to go up to the uh, box up there, and you've got to insult the band." And then Legs is going to come running up. He's going to beat you down, and he's going to throw you off the, onto the stage. And this is a dummy. Threw a dummy. <laughs> so okay. So when it came, I'm like, how do I insult somebody on a stage? You know, it's like, all I was, it was like, so I said, hey, you bunch of communists, 
you're rubbish. You know, and I just did that for about three minutes. And he, Come on, legs, run, man, run. That's right, you were running out of insults. Yeah, yeah, because it was, yeah. No, I didn't have any, any rehearsals. It was just insult them, shout at them. It must have been great good fun. The Bonzos are a British institution. Yeah, yeah they good. were lovely. They were lovely. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were good. It was, yeah. yeah great bunch, Neil and this, yeah. yeah. So I guess, though, uh, things changed a little bit for you when uh, Brian Epstein died, and I guess it was a terrible time, but opportunities opened up for you too, um, strangely. They did, yes. I mean, you know, it's... I. Because they did um, the magical mystery tour. Mm. Now, uh, because even though Mr. Epstein had died, right, the, the, the working still had to carry on. You know, his office was still open, so there was all of that happening. So I, um, yeah, I, in the end, I was just running around, sort of London. You know, going to um, like cutting rooms. Yeah, you did some location scouting and, and work for Magical Mystery I, Tour. I yeah, Mal, Mal actually um, asked me if I would take a, um, a camera and um, so Mal just Evans. go on the street, yeah. bless him, there he is. Just uh, film some streets, you know, take pictures of streets with a Polaroid. And so a limo, <laughs> a limo, bless it. Yeah. Drove around on a Sunday, you know, and that it's was pretty cool. good. A limo just to do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And fortunately, the, the the driver knew where what I was actually looking for and what I had to do. So, yeah, I, it was that was kind of neat. I must admit. Yeah, I mean, and and then uh, so you're working on Magical Mystery Tour, and then and this is by the way, that's the lovely Mal Evans that you worked very closely with. Uh, sadly, departed. Tragic yeah. uh, incident in the seventies on the freeway in LA where he got shot. Unfortunately, mm. um, me, you know, a long time Beatles roadie, um, but uh, you worked quite closely with him. And I guess uh, this was around the time Apple was starting as well. So... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, see, the first time I actually met the Beatles was at a, a preview theater in Wardour Street on Magical Misty Tour. And I'd taken some film from the cutting room to this uh, preview theatre and just handed it to Neil, who I'd, I'd met before, I'd known. known. Um, and he said, come on in and see what we've been doing, which mm. I said, oh, yeah, OK. And I walk in and there's the four boys and he introduced me to them. And that's the first time I actually sort of met them as a whole, I think. Sure, it's, yeah. And of course, you ended up doing things like riding on the bus with Paul McCartney after you delivered some stuff to him, and to start yeah, that, you get to, to... when Apple started. You see, because I, because you know Apple, you know they whatever I, you know you'd have to speak to Lewis and about you know, how how all of that started. But Apple started, and I was still at NEMS, and I thought I'm I don't want to be at NEMS, I want to mm -hmm. be at because they all know me. Um, so I spoke to Peter Brown and he said, no, you know, you, you said you wanted to leave a while back. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, you know, this is kind of different now, you know, and, um, you do, uh, you should really employ me because I know everybody. See, that was the thing, so mm. I, I, you know, I know the situation. And he said, yeah, okay. And that's how I got the job. And then Paul was up in uh, St. John's Wood and went up there to do almost like a daily delivery or a pickup, normally a delivery of my own stuff. And he opened the door and I said, oh, Paul, oh, Kevin, you know, how are you getting back to the office? I was getting on the bus. He said, hang on, I'll get my coat, I'll come with you. <laughs> and so All right. bus stuff and it was like, oh, this is pretty good. Yeah. A bus with Paul McCartney. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. wonder if he rides the bus now. He probably does. I've heard he does do things like that occasionally with a disguise on. But uh, So that was, yeah, you were getting in with Apple and you got to, you, to meet guys like the other Derek Taylor, the publicist, and uh, and Mal took you, kind of took you under his wing, I guess, as in, a, in a sense. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. And for, before you knew it, you were in the studio with the yeah. Beatles. Yeah. You see, Mal... Came into the office uh, one day and said, well, Kevin, we're starting, um, Mal took that. 
He said, Kevin, we're starting an album and I need some groceries, you know, some sandwich stuff. I said, okay. Went out and got two bags full. Um, delivered it to EMI. And uh, it, uh, what was it? 6.30. So the doors were closed. So I knocked on the door. Security man came out. Explained, I got this for Mal. He called Mal. Mal went, thanks. I gave it to him. And I went home. The next day, um, I thought, Mal hasn't come in. I wonder if they need any more. So I just went out and got some fresh stuff. You know, not two bags full, but half a bag full. You know, just... Yeah. You know, and I took it back down at 6.30. And um, same thing, knock on the door. You know, Mal got some things. I said, there you go, Mal. I didn't know if you wanted this or not. And he said, no, I don't need that. And I went, oh, okay. He said, but come on in. And it was like... And this is in the Abbey Road studio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You see, I've, been to, I've been to Abbey Road many a time, but I always had to stop at the reception. And on the right-hand side, there's some swing doors. Mm. Just walk in and out. And I <laughs> always, you know, for two years, like from very early days at NEM, you'd see people walking in and out. And, and I actually got to walk through those double doors. Mal took me downstairs. <laughs> we put the stuff in the kitchen. He said, come with me. And we walked into the studio. Incredible. You almost think there'd be some kind of, you know, angelic choir as you open the doors. But it was, yeah, it was, instead I was just shaking, you know, because, you see, studio Laurie, two, Studio 2, I'm assuming. Yeah, it was yeah. Yeah, the big one, yeah. Laurie, wow. Laurie McCaffrey, the receptionist at NEMS, always said, you know, nobody ever goes to the studios. Nobody, you know, that's a no go area for anybody, you know. So I knew how precious that space was, and I was invited in, and I really was shaking because this was this was a completely new experience, you know. Mm. And um, so I just hid, you know, I just sort of stood behind this stack, just looking while Mal was doing his early evening thing, which I would eventually do myself. And so, yeah, after 10 minutes, it was just, okay, got to go. This is, yeah, you know, and I just left. Yeah. And I, the next day, lo and behold, Mal came in and said, do you want to come and uh, work with me down in the studio doing the gear? I'll show you what to do. I'll show you how to do it. And I just said, yeah, yeah just immediately. Yes, of course. Cool. I mean, it's it's an yeah. incredible moment, really. <laughs> All for half a bag of groceries yeah so one of our uh, great supporters of the channel fkhc2005 i have a question for kevin how did the whole paul is dead thing start no idea no. but that was chaotic <laughs> nobody would answer the phone and all the phones are ringing yeah nobody in the office would pick up the phone this is an apple office or... yeah this is an apple at three savile road nobody yeah. so it was like you know, it's one of those silly things. I think it was because, didn't it have something to do with Abbey Road and Paul walking across the... He barefoot, walking across barefoot and, yeah, various, yeah. it was in a car crash and and there was a, a car. But no, that was a, a real stupid day. Because mm. nobody could make a phone call because the phones were ringing. Yeah, because you know, so everyone wanted to know if Paul was dead. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, yeah. No, it's well, mad. you know you know the gentleman. He, he didn't really die, did he? No, he didn't die. No, he didn't. <laughs> no. no, I can guarantee that. Yeah. So you got involved then, and in, you were setting their gear up in the studio. You were basically doing, you know, they'd ask you to do stuff. You would do it. And this was during the White Album yeah. sessions. Yeah. And that's, that, that other picture is you. You're at Ringo's drum kit there. Yes, yes. Now, at this point, I guess setting up gear like amps and drums is new to you, but I guess you picked it up pretty quick, yeah? Well, it, it, in those days, it was easy, you know, um, except when I first started, what they had was um, old gear, which was uh, with valves. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, and Mal's, you know, Mal's going, well, these, you know, these valves here, you know, change them and all of that. He said, but don't worry, because we're getting some new gear in a little while. 
And I think about a, four or five days later, we got all the Fender stuff, the twin reverbs in the basement. Um, mm. So, you know, that was that was easy. Except the, the twin reverbs, man, they were seriously heavy. All right, yeah, yeah. They really were. I mean, I, I'm so never seriously heavy. When I was carrying them, <laughs> two 12-inch speakers in each one, they were heavy. So when you set that gear up, and I guess in the White Album, they used mainly, I mean, it was Studio 2, but they used every studio, I think, at one point simultaneously. Were you setting the gear up and just leaving it there, or did you have to take it down every night and then reset it up? Was it? it, it that depended on who was in the studio the next day, because we were working during the evenings. You know, I think the studio mm. was open like seven till whenever. Right, so there might have been a Pink Floyd or somebody would be there during the day or another well, band. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, depending on, I mean, at last thing at night, I'd say, who's in? And if they'd say, well, we've got an orchestra, okay, the gear in the bed gets moved, you know. Yeah. And if, well, there's nobody there, okay, then leave it as it is. You just tidy it up and just make sure it's clean and... So, because you, you weren't, although you weren't doing live gigs per se, there was still a lot of gear to be shunted around as a rule. There was enough, you know. It's there was certainly enough, and when you, you know, we say, "Oh, let's let's try the gear," and you know, let's try an amp in this room. Let's, you know, so all of a sudden you're you're amping this this amp to another studio or a room or a corridor or an echo chamber or, you know, and yeah. so, you know, but most of the time you, you're just sitting around waiting for the call. Yeah. And was there, was there, oh, sorry, go ahead, Courtney. You were going to say something? Yeah, I thought Courtney was going to say something. She's, she's gone quiet now. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And guys, if you've got any questions, just uh, chip in, you know, but, uh, but yeah, uh, were the, the boys themselves, getting used to you being around and asking you to do stuff and oh yeah it took it took a couple of weeks i think maybe just a little bit less for you know initially it was mal you know mal you know mal i need it mal can you do this mal you know and then eventually it was oh, kevin can you do this and you know that was down in point you know or kevin can you get this and you know then the name starts getting mentioned and then it's you know ah, kevin you know where's mal and, you know, and it's all of that kind of stuff, you know. It's so, yeah, to trust you, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what can you recall about specific things like when George left briefly and they ended up recording back in the USSR with multiple people drumming on it, and uh, and things like your blues where they all sort of went into a small room and just recorded in one go? Were you there for these kind of sessions? I the thing is, Brian, I was there for all the sessions. Yeah. Do I remember them? No. No. <laughs> but I know I was there because I never had a night off. Yeah, I guess it was a different it, schedule it, entirely working in that gig. It's like being on the road. Mm. You know, you. it's the same thing every single day, right? Mm. But what makes it different is if something kind of changes or something happens that's you know out of the ordinary yeah you know and in those days everything was ordinary yeah it was routine like anything else it has a routine yeah. to it i guess yeah. and emi was a routine you know it's yeah you know it's i, I know it sounds strange but it when you're no you know, normal the, yeah. yeah, it's just normal. It's, you know, six, eight, ten hours a night. Uh, I mean, uh, you were still only, what, 17 at this time or 18? 18. 18, yeah. And this is you. This is Let It Be at Twickenham, of course. But uh, That would be 19. Yeah, the, what, the White Album, um, you were there throughout the whole of that. Then it went into the whole uh, Let It Be stuff. Yeah. Which was the last album released but not the last one recorded of course so and of course get back i mean the, the get back peter jackson thing did you have any involvement in that recent no. uh no. project no no, no. nobody contacted you ask you anything no no mark lewis and i guess knows it also <laughs> yes yeah, yeah I, I would ask mark lewis but yeah no yeah so 
flipping around Beatles wise a little bit. This is the this is you on the rooftop holding the lyrics to dig a pony for John. Yeah. Um probably at this time you hadn't done any tours or anything, but this is probably one of the most famous gigs of all time. And <laughs> you were there. I know, I know. That's why it's just so so bizarre. It, yeah. Did, it, did you think you were gonna get arrested? No, oh, I wasn't going to get arrested. No. They might have got arrested. But <laughs> I wasn't got arrested because I was just a roadie. You know, I wasn't was making it? noise. Yeah, I mean, what do you recall about that actual day? I mean, was I think it was pretty touch and go at the end of whether we were going to do it or not. Um, yet again, you see, because of my position, I wasn't consulted. You know, it's like any roadie will tell you. He's, he's not consulted about where you're playing. He's only told where you're playing. Right, I get it. You know, yeah. um, I was, I was told, okay, we're doing it on the roof. You know, at one point, Mal did say, "Oh, we might be going to Greece," and that did excite me. But, yeah. uh, but then, apart from that, no, it was just okay. We're up on the roof in about a, whenever long it was, you know. Yeah, and that's when you'd gone back to Abbey Road because Let It Be started off at Twickenham Studios. And that must have been a bit of a nightmare. It, it wasn't pleasant, that's yeah. for sure. I mean, I even in my um, inexperience, you know, but bearing in mind, I'd done, what, five months, I think the Double White album took, so I was at, in the studio for five months. Um, and it just was not conducive to what they wanted to do. Even I could kind of see that. Yeah, Twickenham was a big empty sound stage, and it was the middle of winter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so it was, you know. And then you got all these strangers about, which they're not used to, you know. Even though, you know, I'm sure at that point they could, you know, ignore. Oh dear, ignore <laughs> a lot of. Um, <laughs> You take that off. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that one because there's a story behind that one, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, so ah, I'll, I'll just Kevin, just for a second, I'd like to to just uh, say to, thank you to my great friend Christian Delorme for the ten dollar super chat. Appreciate you very much, buddy, and appreciate your support of the channel. And thank you everybody for being here in the chat uh, and watching. Uh, so Christian says, "Bonjour, everybody." A quick question: Is he rowdy? And he means a rock and roll rowdy like Hobbit and our other friends um what was the most dreaded piece of equipment to move and why uh, did you have any hammond uh, organs to move I, or moogs uh i i would say without a doubt a hammond b3 organ i was just gonna say that too I was yeah. gonna yeah. that. You know, the thing is with when i first started rodeoing I was, it was with a band called Rupert's People. Okay. Then, right. And Steve Brendel was the drummer. He was one of my uh, office boyfriend, right, at NEMS. He was yeah. a, band, um, like a semi pro band. Mm. And so my first roading stuff was with Rupert's People because he would say, hey, we've got a gig this Friday. You know, that's when I, that's the only time I ever worked on a Friday or a Saturday, we'd be in semi pro. And John Tout had a B3 organ. And so that was um, that was the, the heaviest thing. Yeah, you know, and they're a bugger, I bet you. Yeah. Yeah. Going, going for a club. But you see, at the same time, you know, with Derek and the Dominoes, we had a B3. Hmm. You know, and carrying that up, uh, you know, stairs and stuff, it was just a nightmare. But that's... Yeah. Hey, that's the job, eh? That's, that's the job. You know... I just wanted to play a little clip. To... Very, very heavy. Very heavy. Yeah, yeah, I had I... To, I had three people moving mine out. So oh, you, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, take... I couldn't even push it like on the floor to move it against the wall, like on my own. Nothing. It was just like dead weight. <laughs> and I'll tell you another heavy, heavy bit of equipment was orange cabinets. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But they really were beasties. And I think Hobbit will most probably tell you that because he did more of the humping than I did with Wishbone when they had orange gear. Yeah, yeah. They, they were they it still Valve? So good. <laughs> yeah, the orange you still get them today, of course. Were they Valve? They were still Valve based then as well, so even bigger and heavier. Yeah. 
good fun. <laughs> yeah, I just want to play a little clip to thank Christian for his super chat. So let me find an appropriate one. Uh, we'll go for the we'll go for the good old fashioned um, James Brown. So thank you, Christian. Thank I was you. going to play this one. I'll play this one anyway because we've talked about the White Album. You know, I'm I'm not a great one for that. You know, maybe it was too many of that. Look, what do you mean? It was great. It sold. It's the bloody Beatles White Album. Mm. Shut up. It's for the people who complain that the White Album shouldn't have been a double album, and there's too much stuff in it. That's Paul's response. Uh, did you get a number? <laughs> yeah, define too much. Did you get a numbered copy, Kevin, of the White Album? You know, they all had a number in them. Even every ones you could buy, all's a number. Did you have a numbered? Do you remember the number? No, I don't. I'll, I'll have to dust off the old uh, record collection and have a look. But yeah, because no. because they all had a number. I know, and and bizarrely, I think Ringo had number one. Did he know? Well, you see, the thing is, the thing about a double white album is that I'm, I'm on the inside of that. I mean, uh, yeah. despite being thanked, uh, you know, my name in the back of the cover. Also, there was a big, like, spread out sheet of photos. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, there's a photo of George, and there's a fuzzy picture of me behind George. Right. And yeah. that was an exciting thing for me that ever. Absolutely. Oh. Even though it wasn't a perfect picture of me, it was like, that's me, man. Well, that's if you it. think about it, getting your getting your picture, uh, getting a credit on one of the biggest selling and most famous albums of all time is pretty something special. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I think yeah. so. There's also, I mean, there's more photos here from, from these are all from Get Back. Um, but yeah, this was the... Uh, I think this is back in the Abbey Road studio. No. Or is that still at uh, Pinewood? No, that's uh, that's Twickenham. Twickenham. Still yeah. Twickenham, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's uh, George Martin, who probably wasn't very happy at the time. I uh, uh, see yet again, I, you know, it, what went on between them is, you know, what went on between them. I, yeah, you were... I was equipment, you know. Yeah, setting so, up this gear. Billy Preston, of course, oh, came yeah. in. Lovely man, lovely yeah, man. Yeah, came in to, to smooth things over and play some great uh, piano on uh, on the Let It Be stuff. Yeah, I remember when he when he came over to England. Uh, George asked me to um, sort of look after him, and you know just make sure that he had yeah whatever he you know needed and any you know. So the first thing was some pot. <laughs> yeah, well, indeed, I've always heard he was a lovely guy, though, and uh, he, he was he was he was wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And then, um, oh, Yoko. <laughs> bless, bless. Yep. There's a picture coming up though of your good self. Uh, is this it? is back in Abbey Road, I think. Yeah, uh, or back in the Apple, maybe. No, that's an Apple. It's Apple, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not Magic Alex's studio, though, the real no. studio. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it's Apple Studio just with not Alex's, uh, well, Magic Alex's equipment, really. Yeah, which was all a bit of a joke, I think. But um, there's you and Paul in the background. Uh, yeah. There's you doing some, getting some gear together. Uh, and then... Uh, I mean, we don't. We can't play any of the music. I'm afraid. But, no, uh, no, that's you know. I I understand. There's some yeah copyright there's restrictions that one has to uh, abide by. <laughs> yeah, but if you watch, uh, let it be or get back. Um, you can see Kevin all the time in it because yeah, your hair, your hair's the giveaway a lot of the I time. No, man, you can't miss that, can you? And it's, yeah. you know, and I do have the let it be book. And I think I'm right in saying that on this page, for instance, there's you. Um, I think that's you there. Yep. With Mal. Yep. You, you with Mal. Yeah. Uh, there's a few others in, in, in this book that you're in. This is the Let It Be that came with the album originally, I think. Yeah, and that pissed me off. 
Yeah, what, that you were in the picture? No, that um, yeah. they, what they put me down as. Oh, they put you, so your credit on there was, was different? Fucking runner. Oh, runner, right, yeah. Runner, man. Yeah. You know, You're a roadie. Uh, you were was, a roadie, equipment manager. Yeah, but in the book, it's runner. Yeah. I, uh, I complained about that. I yeah, I mean, who, who made those decisions, though? I don't know, but I sent a text, uh, an email, um, complaining. Yeah. That uh, I wasn't a runner. I did what Mal did. I yeah, carried exactly. that equipment to Ruth. I set their equipment up for three, yeah. two years. But it three. is fair to say that on the get back, Peter Jackson get back, they do have you credited here as a roadie. And, yes, and the reason is because I complained about the book. Right, okay. It came out before they'd actually finished doing the credits on the film. On Let It Be or Get Back? The, well, on this Peter Jackson one. On the Peter Jackson, yeah, because this was the Let It Be book, the original from back in the day. Which is oh, is it? Yeah. Uh, okay. if, you, if you look at the book... I've got the Get Back book by, back here, yeah. Right, well, if you look at it, that, you know, it's, it's I'm a runner. And that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why I bought my bloody book out. You know, but you know they they had an interview that I did with Mark Lewison, right? I mean, I shouldn't see. That. Um, you know, so they knew what I did. If they bothered to look at the interview, yeah. And Mark is the and, and is to the do film. that put me down as a runner. Mm. Uh, just it it fucked me off because that was just disrespectful as far as I was concerned. Yeah. You know. Anyway, you were there, and you were there back in the day doing all this stuff. Um, I know we showed a little photograph earlier, which uh, was <laughs> just tell us about this particular day. Can you recall? Uh, that's um, that was Valentine's Day. Yeah, I uh, think it's yeah. the apples. Isn't it the Apple Office? Yeah, that's outside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's just uh, that little badge there was given to me by the uh, Apple Scruffs. That is yeah. some fabulous hair. It is great hair. You, you actually, you, you do kind of look a bit like because it's a blurry photo. You could almost be mistaken for Eric Clapton in certain, uh, certainly. It's <laughs> well, here. Of you, but I, I can't see that. But thank you. Yeah. Um, so this was the, yeah the Apple Scruffs. Tell us about the Apple Scruffs then. They well, there's only you see as far as. There's, I mean, the, the Beatles fans, yeah, but there was just a certain few of them that were there constantly. You know, mm. like Margot and Sue. And they were outside the front door all the time of Apple. And, but they, they would also turn up at like Trident, you know, uh. and, you, and you'd go, how do you know that we were here? You know, Green and line. <laughs> the apple scruffs say yeah, that and they took it in shifts as well they wouldn't they, 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 they were amazing they were amazing they were lovely yeah. they were lovely and and you were named uh mr valentine for 1970 <laughs> i think by them yeah 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 that's it there <laughs> yeah. pretty uh, cool it's uh, it's funny they were lovely people there's another picture of you uh with paul getting into a car i think it's a mini yes it is it's his mini cooper s yeah, and going somewhere unknown. Uh, that, I think, is possibly from Twickenham, maybe, um, I don't yeah. know. I've got a feeling it's Twickenham. Yeah, it could be, yeah. And then uh, you uh, carting some gear for George. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, nice. Coming out of uh, Apple. Yeah. Were you, I mean, I think you, you kind of, I get the feeling reading your book, you kind of gravitated towards George a little bit more and as time went on in terms of working for him and doing stuff. Yeah. Um, the first day I sort of was actually in the studio, the very first night, I was mm -hmm. hiding behind this um, monitor, as I found out later, that's what it was called. Yeah, and George was sitting on the floor, you know, just tuning up, playing guitar or whatever. And he just said, Kevin, come on over. Tell me about yourself. Mm. And so I just sat down. I don't know, it was about 10, 10 minutes or so. We were just chatting away. And 
you know, he was the youngest of the band, and I guess, you know, I, I don't know how it happened, but it just kind of, but you've got to remember, you know, they did all sort of drift away. You know, they split up, basically. You yeah, know, but that was nice of him to take the time to do that and make you feel at ease. Yeah, yeah it was. It was, yeah, that's why that's, I have a certain spot, soft spot for George, just because of that, because yeah, you feel welcome. You know, on my very first night. That's pretty cool, and and I know that um, you've got a lot of great stories about George's house, Friar oh. Park, Park, which you helped him to move into. Small, um, small place, small place, small place. I didn't actually help him to move into. What happened was we were in the studio uh, one night, and he just said, "Hey, Kevin, I've just moved into a big house, Park, <laughs> and." Uh, it's empty. Do you want to come and just, you know, just make up the numbers? Just, you know, and I said, yeah, yeah. You know, could, you never said no anyway. You know, I mean, regardless. Mm. And he said, okay, right, just bring some gear in tomorrow, some, you know, change of clothes and all that. And then uh, that was it. I was stayed there for, okay, it was four months or so, five months. It, I have to work it out because when the uh, Krishnas came, that's oh, that when I moved out because it was, you know, they were filling up the house. So, yeah. Now, this, it, this place is something else. I mean, it was a some eccentric guy that built it and it was extremely gothic and creepy and ghosts, I guess, ghost ridden, supposedly. Well, no, not ghost ridden, but there, there was a rumor that uh, there was a ghost there. Terry Doran, uh, George's assistant, did say he had actually seen him. The guy uh, was built by a guy called Crisp. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, and it's just oak, you know, just it, um, just a phenomenal place. But it's a hell of a scary. place. George, I think, kind of rescued it from falling apart, really. Over yeah, there, yeah, it was um, it was owned before then by a, uh, I think, a, a convent or something. Hmm. So it was really dilapidated. You know, there's yeah, it was just dirty. It was yeah, just so neglected. So, I mean, the grounds look wonderful there, but when we moved in, they were just overgrown. And yeah, didn't know any. You know, the, it was just a mess. So we spent most of that summer just cleaning windows, sweeping floors, gardening. You know, I mean, we uh, like there's, there's a just to the right of that at the back. There's a called the Matterhorn part of the oh, garden. All right. Right. Yeah. Was, so all you could see basically was just this little bit of Matterhorn at the top of this mound of vegetation. Mm. Um, it took us, I don't know, a week just to sort of clear all the all around it and clear the clear the steps going up to it. And yeah, it was a lot of work. There was there was some good fun, good fun there. How yeah. many rooms were in that place? Do you know? Sorry. How many rooms? We're in that place, do you know? Um, offhand, I don't know exactly. But a lot. <laughs> but there Dozens. was a lot. Dozens. I, I've heard rumors of a hundred and something. I'm, wow. I'm not really sure if that's, that's correct, to be honest yeah. with you. I don't believe there's a hundred. But I, I could be wrong after all these years. It's interesting <laughs> that George, who, and I've been to George's house in Liverpool that he but was born and brought up in, small terraced house in a very you know, small street in Liverpool and he ends up in this place. <laughs> it's quite the story. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a wonder. It's it's yeah. a beautiful place. Had some really good fun times there. First oh, time yeah. I did it there. Did it ever get fully refur uh, refurbished or did it get oh, fully yes. re renovated? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think Absolutely. it did, yeah. George put a lot of love and care into it. You see it oh. a lot in an anthology. They're filming in an anth they're an anthology quite a bit in the garden. And uh, Oh, yeah. No, it's, no, George did a wonderful job. Wonderful he became enough. quite the gardener, I think. He was quite into that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's I can't remember what it was, 24 acres or something. It was, mm. it was, it was, it was a lot of ground. Just a know, small place. Just a small place. Around there on the little monkey bikes and yeah, just yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty spooky at night, though, I would think. Uh, well, I, you know, uh, the first night, I'll tell you about the first night. Uh, 
We drive back from uh, uh, EMI and uh, go in and George, we go in the front front door because George said, listen, I don't normally come in this entrance, but you, I'm taking you in this main front door. And I just walked in, it was just like, whoa, this is incredible. It's just like almost empty, you know, because it just moved in. So there's mm. no furniture at all. But big, I mean, it must have been massive ceilings and like high up. Well, high the, the, main, the main hall, uh, you know, like the, what we call the, yeah, the main hall. It, yes, it was two stories and, well, wow. you know, with a gallery going around it for bedrooms and things. And in the corner there was a grand staircase and, oak, you know, and it's all dark oak and there's all little, well, um, all the all the white, all the light switches were monks and the nose was the on off switch. That's yeah. funny. Oh, God. I've never seen that pictures of that. No, that's incredible. It's all over the place. I mean, yeah. it was it was dark. One, because there was no light bulbs, you know. <laughs> and uh, So, and Terry Doran, who was a wonderful man, wonderful, sadly no longer with us. Mm. He uh, today came, we're going to do, put you in the um, library for tonight, right, until we sort something out. And so I go into, eventually, you know, after a few smokes and uh, a few babies. He says, "Yeah, we're going." So we get a talk, and he goes, the library, and it's like you know, oak, dark, and there's big wow. windows. And this, you go back to the picture. It's overlooking, overlooking the uh, the front of the garden, right? So it's, and um, and it's a windy night, and below it is Henley on Thames. So you can see the light from Henley on Thames. You know, just sort of. You know the ambient light and you can see the trees so they're blowing like this and so when you turn the torch up all you can see on the walls right now bear in mind i'm a bit pissed and very stoned just all of this movement mm. i'd be terrified oh, oh i know i'd hate that <laughs> I'm just... whoa you know whoa seriously whoa it was like oh i'm a horror you yeah. know like, whoa. Like and in those days, there weren't anything like security or anything, right? Right? You guys were just on your own. Yeah, yeah. No security. Yeah. yeah. No, no security whatsoever. Anyone could literally come up to to this place. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, we had a couple of intruders. Yeah. One night we were in the hall. Uh, George wasn't there with Patty. I think I was with. Um, I think it was George's cousin Greg had come over from the states. Hmm. We were sitting in front of the big fire and. Above the big fire is a um, stained glass window. And I can't remember what was on the stained glass window. Right? But it's a big stained glass window. At some point, Terry had put a light outside the roof, shining up. So this stained glass window is lit from the back. So you're sitting there in a big fire, you know. And Greg goes up to his bedroom, so he's up around the gallery. And Terry shouts out, put the light on. So, yeah, sure, man. Turns the light on, and he said, and we hear, hey, man, there's a guy on the roof. Hey, man, there's a guy on the roof. Mm. Right? And just like, well, I was like, what? Oh, oh, oh. So we run back down through to the kitchen, and by this time, this guy's just skedaddled. Because he was really risking everything going up there. Risking what? Well, he could have fallen off. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, that's his fault, isn't it? You know. Well, I knew, but what a, I found the ladder pretty quick. I do know that because yeah. he was gone into the woods and out the back, and yeah, that was just well, some place though, some place. Yeah, it was it was lovely. I had a wonderful, wonderful time there. I must admit. And in dry, you know, I sort of it was like you see when the Beatles weren't working, I weren't working. I weren't. Mm. I wasn't working. You know, so. We would just be gardeners, cleaners, or whatever. And then on a Friday night, we'd drive into London, go to the clubs, you know, and then wake up on a Saturday morning and you're back out in this amazing place. So I guess when you say the clubs, you'd be talking about places like the Speakeasy or. I would. Yeah. 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 Where everybody hung out at yeah. the time, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
Must have encountered some pretty famous, uh, other famous rock stars in there too. No more famous than your bosses, of course. But. No, no, no. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I'm sure we did. I mean, I actually did a gig there with Derek and the Dominoes. Ah, right, okay, because we're definitely mm. going to get another. I mean, things were drawing to a close, as we know, with the Beatles. I mean, you'd done the White Album, you'd done Let It Be, then the final recorded album, uh, Abbey Road, um, which was a much quieter affair, no, nowhere near the same amount of, of uh, there was no cameras, really. It was all, just, oh, no, let's it, just get this it done. Was like, it was like it was in the Double White Album. Yeah, let's just get it done. It yeah, back intimate, nice little studio, um, you know. Yeah. Um, do you happen to recall this particular day when the, I'm going to show it in the stream when they're, they're walking over the... Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, but a week or so before that, there's a photo, which I have, uh, one that uh, it'll come out pretty soon, of me, uh, two porters, and Steve Brendel, we are walking exactly like that across mm. the zebra crossing, which um, Ian, uh, Ian, Ian McMillan took to show them. Oh, uh, you did the demo in effect, yeah. And so, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, oh, I remember it, yeah. And you've got a copy of that photo for yourself I have, still? I have, yeah. Cool, that's really yeah. cool. I uh, just want to say hi to our friend, to our friend Gary, Pop Culture Minefield, who's popped by. Hello to everybody hey. in the chat. Thank you for being here with us uh, on this great show with our guest, Kevin Harrington. Uh, and that Abbey Road, last one recorded, a great album. I mean, it is a fabulous album. Um, end of an era, obviously, but uh, I mean, Let It Be came out after, but by that time, really... I guess it was all over for your work with the Beatles as a group. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly. Uh, yeah. Um, still an incredible time. But you'd, by this time, I think when you were sort of 19, 20, you were looking at doing other things anyway. You wanted to actually go on the road and do more. I'd always that. wanted to go on the road. Yeah. You know, uh, ever, uh, I think ever since, you see, I was offered the road. Um, road manager's job when I was 17 by Johnny Fanning, mm. who was Sounds Incorporated. Program. Oh, yeah, Sounds Incorporated, yeah. Right. Um, Top session group of the time in Britain and did a lot of uh, did a lot of their own records too, but big session band, yeah. Yes, yes. And um, so I, I, I was just a little bit young, I think. I was, you know, it was just the wrong time. But Johnny Fanning was a, a roadie, you know. It was like I... Grew up with roadies, you see. It's like, let me tell you, the first time I met Mal and Neil was at NEMS in '66. Yeah. Um, and Laurie McCaffrey, the section, said, Mal and Neil are coming today. <laughs> they work for the boys. <laughs> yes, the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and these two guys walked in, right? Suit, uh, not suit, but ties and stuff. And they had an aura about them. Hmm. I've since discovered it's called confidence. You know, well, they knew what they were, they knew what they did, and they were confident, confident in their themselves, hmm. right? Well, they'd, that, been, they'd been through the wars with the Beatles, I mean, from the early days onwards. Yeah. yeah. But, and then my sexing, second encounter, besides sort of the roadies with the Bee Gees and all the others from the stable, them stable, and that the most impressive was Creams. Mm. When they walked in, God, I mean, they were like something I'd never seen. So Cream's roadies were like superstars. <laughs> well, they, they were just, you know, it was like jeans and turquoise and, you know, buckskin and just, you know, do you know what I mean? They were just like, yeah. It's just yeah. like Courtney's normal get up. Just, it was just, <laughs> like, wow. That was something else. Um, I, I said, I said I to leather jackets, okay. <laughs> do you want a cup of tea? And um, mm -hmm. they were sitting down in the accounts because that's why I need 
anybody comes into NEMS is to, for the account, basically. Right. Right, you know. I and said, to yeah. get a cup of tea. And to get a cup of tea. Gave him a cup of tea and one work in his suitcase. He pulls out a bottle of scotch. And it's only about half eleven. And just <laughs> dug, 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 into his tea. Right? I'm just like, I am so impressed with this one. You know, he said, do you want some? And it was like, mm, no, thank you. You know, but it was just, whoa. Whoa. Yeah, indeed. So that's what you, you went, I want to be that guy. Almost, almost. I didn't know it at the time, but it was kind of like, yeah, they had this thing about me. So yeah. I always wanted to go on the road. It's like with Johnny Fanning. Mm -hmm. Sounds incorporated. You know, uh, my greatest thing with Johnny was that in between shows at the Savile, right, we would go to the pub. Um, Sounds Incorporated were doing shows one night. I think it might have been with Jim Pitney or whoever, right? Um, we went to the pub. And it's The pub's even because it's in the West End on a Sunday night, right? Mm. And it was Johnny's shout. And he said, all right, my shout, what do you want? Yeah, fine, okay. I said, God, you know, it's it's absolutely chocker. How are you going to get through that? He said, don't you worry. He stood up and he went, excuse me. Excuse me, please. Excuse me. And just, it parted. <laughs> it parted for the roadie. <laughs> um, excuse me. Excuse me, please. Excuse me. Coming through. And of course, every male bum moved. Mm. <laughs> but, you know, and it was like, and I'm sitting there just thinking, that's impressive. That's the confidence that's you want. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's how you do it. And that lesson took me all the way to 16 years. Just wow. Boom. Cool. I know how to get through an audience. Yeah. And by this time, I think just before you, you mentioned uh, Steve Brindell and your, your friend and Rupert's people, but you met through that Miles Copeland and the guys from Wishbone Ash, who we're going to talk about later. And that also gave you kind of a taste of the future or what could be? Um, I, I don't know. You see, Miles uh, met them in Beirut. They, they did some cabaret thing in a hotel in Beirut and hmm. Miles was living in Beirut at the time, whatever, and uh, he decided he wanted to manage them. So he, they, came, they all came back and Steve left to go on the road with Rupert's people to France. And I wanted to be on that bus, that tour bus with them, right? But you know, they they couldn't afford, you know, another roadie. They couldn't afford it. Yeah, or anything really. You know, they carried their own gear for so many years. You know, but that's when I I kind of realised that's what I want to do. I want to be on the road. Yeah. You know, and then the Beatles sort of split up, um, and George started All Things Must Pass, and. Yeah. Um, Besides sort of, you know, Leon and Russell and all these other people coming down, Eric came down with basically the band that was Delaney and Bonnie's lot. Yeah, bless. Yeah, and then, uh, so yeah, so you start, you see, so you started to get, yeah, the Beatles were ending and you knew Eric through things like that. You'd met Delaney and Bonnie and then, then Dwayne, uh, Derek and the Dominoes came onto the scene. Yeah. Uh, and you that was really the main split you you wanted to go with them because the Beatles were done anyway I guess yeah uh, but you see they had a their tour manager was a guy called Bruce McCaskill yeah who used to be a uh, guitarist with swinging blue jeans oh yeah I've seen that <laughs> <life. laughs> yeah, so you know it's yeah. go back a long time um yeah. and he was also Delaney and Bonnie's tour manager and mm. uh, so he came down to, because he was looking after Eric and, you know, Carl and Bobby and Jim. They, he was yeah. coming down to them. He was their tour manager. So he would come to the sessions with them. And so for, I don't know, a couple of weeks or so, you know, we, we would hang out together. And, yeah. um, and he knew that I was kind of wanted to go on the road. And he was saying, well, we're going on the road soon. Do you want to come with us? And so it turned out that they were then called Derek and the Dominoes. They weren't Derek and the Dominoes in the studio. No. But it was, um, yeah. And so I said yes, because you know, I had to do it. And uh, I told George, 
you know, that I was leaving. He wasn't, uh, wasn't kind of best pleased, but I think he, I'm hoping he understood. But, you know, well, that, you had, you had to do it. I mean, it was for you. This was for you. Yeah, yeah that's right. You know, it was, yeah. You know, cause I went, because I couldn't see any. See, George had said, you know, he didn't want to go on the road again. You know. Yeah, he just wanted to record. Yeah, Paul had left. He'd started his own band, so he'd, he'd got his own roadies. It's, you see, being a Beatle roadie, you know, he just left the Beatles. He's not going to take somebody, you know. And then John did, you know, Plastic Ono band. You know, um, I wasn't invited onto that one either. So it was kind of like I'm getting left out here. And, you know, mm. And I want to travel. I, I want to experience all of these things. Because you've got to remember, I sat in the studios for two years just listening to Rhodey's stories. Mm. You know, or, you know, the Hollies lot, you know. Because um, they'd sit there with Mal, you know, and me being inexperienced and young, I'm just sort of sit, almost sitting in the corner sort of lapping this up like a little bit. <laughs> yeah. you know, I want this, I want this. Cause they all were, this tales from the road, yeah. I mean, global <laughs> travel too. I mean, this is, I Maybe. guess you hadn't really been out of the UK by then. No, only only on holidays, France. Just holidays, yeah. yeah. You know, and so it was like, I want this, you know. I, so so was it, so, so this was during All Things Must Pass recordings that these guys yeah. were, were involved. And then Bruce, did Bruce make you the offer and say, do you want to come with us? I mean, was that how it? He did. He did. Yeah. And, and they I, were going on tour. Were you there for the album, the, the Layla album, or was it just? Uh, a, I should have been. Yeah. But right now, bear this one in mind, man. I'd left George, right? Joined Derek and Adonos. We were going to Miami to record an album. Yeah. Right? Arrive at Heathrow, right? The band are there. Bruce is there. Bruce takes me apart and he said, Kevin. Got some bad news. Management have decided that they can't afford for you to go. Oh, Jesus. So there I was. I'd left George doing an album. Um, thinking, oh, I'll be doing an album in Miami. Mm. No. So I had to wait however long it was, three weeks or whatever the bloody time was, twiddling my thumbs. So they but, went off to Miami, did the album, then you were going to do the tour with them, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, I had my, I had my mates, you see, Wishbone Ash. Yeah. Because I'd met Wishbone in 69 at Miles Copeland's house. These guys, yeah. Yeah. You know, they were just starting up, like Steve and uh, Martin, the bass player, were holding, having auditions for guitarists. You know, because I knew Miles and, you know, all of that, it was, I just kind of hung around, you know, and I got to know Steve and Martin and just kind of hung around. And I kind of remember them, you know, coming down for auditions, you know. And so so I knew them from the beginning, you know, before they were whispering, really. Yeah. And you were, yeah, you were going to have quite a long relationship with them in the 70s. So the, the Derek and the Domino's tour, though, I mean, obviously Dwayne Ullman wasn't a part of that, but... Did you do like a UK, European, American thing with them, or was it? It was actually it was only um, it was only England and America. We did we were yeah. meant to do one show in Nice in the south of France. It was yeah. like a warm up gig, um, and we <laughs> we uh, my first food fight. We um, <laughs> were it like a little villa that this wonderful man had rented to us and. Uh, we went to check out the gig, right, in, the, in a minibus with Bruce driving, and we're going along this sort of dirt track road with all these other cars, you know. I don't know if you, you know what it's like going to festivals, right? And, I, mm. and well, we stop because we can't get any further, and we can see the stage. And what we can see is a fucking riot. Oh, dear. And the piano being thrown off the stage. It was the day of the free oh, yeah. It was the days of free festivals, man. Peace and love. Well, you know, it's, you know. Peace, love, and hell's angels. Yeah. It was just ordinary French, you know, the revolutionaries. You know, we want a free festival. Well, you know, who's going to pay for the bands? You know, mm. the, the it was play. all the rage, free festivals, yeah. yeah. No, hang on. You know, you don't, nothing's for free, you know. Yeah. 
But you, so you're already, I mean, that's thrown in the deep end already doing <laughs> as a roadie. <laughs> yeah, and so we went back to the villa and just got flat asked. Best as well, yeah. Derek and the Dominoes were seriously into drugs. Oh, well, yeah, Eric was a. Well, you, know, you see, the difference between the Beatles and Derek and the Dominoes with drugs is, you know, chalk and cheese. Mm. Really? Yeah, Eric had his problems, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, did you do. We, <laughs> yeah, we spent a lot of money. It went up his nose, and uh, we're not that this yeah, show would I mean, ever condemn well, such th uh, condone such things. Well, as per was, the YouTube's terms of service, you know, in those days it was you know um, it was like qualudes, mescaline, mm. you know, coke. But it was it was not really coke so much as up yeah. and down, it's like black bombers. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's or, it's, it's yeah, remember it black bombers. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, I know, yeah. yeah the, the, well, the, you know, the black bomber was a 24 hour, right? Yeah. And then you had a, a white and black, which was yeah. a 12 hour. It was <laughs> and, and I should say, for the benefit of YouTube, we're only talking about this from a historical perspective because oh, it was part of the music scene. Um, so please don't exactly. cancel us. Please don't cancel us. <laughs> well, you know. But I, I wanted to ask you about one particular thing, and you may not have been involved, but Eric, uh, Derek and I always did the Johnny Cash show in but America. Nashville. Were you involved in that show at all? Or? Well, if it was with the Derek and the Dominoes. Um, yeah, it's the only it time. If it was our equipment, then we, we, we would have been there. You see, Jim Gordon's on drums. I. Yeah. I know we did, um, you see, we did the uh, Grand Old Opry. So if that's the Grand Old Opry, then yeah. Because I, I vaguely remember. Uh, oh. No, this is, the, this is the Johnny Cash show, and it's the only time Derek and the Romanos did a TV performance, I think, that I'm, certainly an American TV performance. Presumably they were on tour, and you were on tour with them at the time. Yes, and i got to be honest with you, I don't remember. Yeah. I, I mean, I really, that, but that was your first American tour, I think, you'd yeah. ever done. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what was that like for you? Was that quite exciting to, to get out there on the road and immediately be touring the States? Um, well, we did England first, uh, which um, was interesting, you know, uh, to say the least. Uh, I threw Jimmy Pay, uh, Robert Plant off stage one night. Um, All right. To my uh, absolute horror. Yeah, uh, the band had gone on stage, right? Um, I think it might have been Birmingham Town Hall. Because we did town halls and little clubs. Mm. No, I mean little clubs, you know. Uh, and the deal was that um, nobody was allowed on stage. Right? And so I'm sort of there and Baz Ward, the, it was like the head roadie because you know, I'm inexperienced. And we had another guy called Pappy. And... and um, Baz comes up to me and says, who's that? And I look around, and it just looks like a scruffy-haired student, to be honest, right? Um, I said, I don't know. He says, we'll get him off. So I sort of asked the guy to leave, right? And then Peppy comes running up. He says, oh, man, do you know who you just thrown off stage? I said, no. He said, it's Robert Plant. It's <laughs> Robert Plant off stage, yes. yes. Oh, that's right. Oh, I wonder if Robert Plant remembers that. <laughs> He's like, that bastard. And I know uh, at the end of the show, Bruce came on the stage. He said, who fucking threw Robert off stage? And Baz, hey. and Baz just looked at me and I looked yeah. at Baz. And Baz said, you told us nobody's allowed on stage. Yeah, you were doing your job. Exactly. Was your job, yeah, that was... Yeah. yeah. So that, this is the one of the British gigs, I think. So you were you set this up. You were you were part of the setup for this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, you, that you, was um, ex nice uh, keyboard roadie. So his one of the reasons why he got the job was because of uh, the Hammond, bless it, the Hammond his. thing. Yeah. And, and the Leslie cabinets. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been a lot of fun because that was that was a. a I mean, they only toured that one time. Um, it's pretty legendary. I, mean, yes. I loved it. I love Derek and the Dominoes. I love that Layla album. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, yeah. We also, oh, there's some of your, this is your memorabilia. I think you actually auctioned this at one point. But I, I did, yes. yes. Yeah, this is your backstage passes. University of Nevada, Sacramento Memorial Auditorium. And the badge and the, the patch is pretty cool. Looks yeah, cool that, stuff. That Eric and the Domino's patch was um, luggage. Oh, Lug that was luggage, right. That is sweet, yeah. You must have still, I mean, I know you've auctioned this, but you must still have an awful lot of other stuff. No, no, I, I, do, no, I, I had to get rid of it, I'm afraid. You slimmed down, yeah, you got rid of a lot of stuff. Uh, you also, though, um, at this time, worked with the Stones and, and round about this era, I'm not sure exactly which tour, but Sticky Fingers era, I think it must have been just before that, anyway. Uh, so you'd done some Stones yeah, I, tour. Yeah, I did one, and that, uh, to be honest with you, that it was um, it was a nightmare. I was um, basically, the only thing I can tell you about that, it was, I, was, I was a drunk. I just fucking blew it. It was okay. completely just, just as they say, I let everybody down, including myself. <laughs> you know, um, so my memories of that are just not worth thinking about. And sure, sure, but at least yeah, you must have seen a few of their gigs and been involved for a little. Well, I, mean, I, I think it was, um, what was it? What was it? Oh, the tour will come back to me. It was um, well in '71. They did a UK tour. With Since sticky, people the devil, I think it was too. Yeah, the gimme shelter stuff, maybe. Yeah. I can't I can't remember now because was it Al pre or, was it pre or post Altamont? I just, you know, just, they had that big I'm festival. Sorry, really just dates are just sure. I don't know. I mean, I tell you what, I will give you an example. Many years later I was doing a, a stage manager's job in Dublin. And uh there was two headliners, that's why I got the gig, with Judas Priest and Status Quo. Oh, when, we priest. Arrived, when we arrived at, when I arrived at Heathrow, I heard this, Gavin, fucking hell, man. I thought you would have been dead by now. Right? And then he said, do you remember being hoisted out of a gig, strapped to a chair? Okay. Now, this is a roadie. All right. A roadie has been hoisted out of a gig, strapped to a chair. That's Sorry, not a... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, past yeah. alcohol stuff. So I can relate. If so, you, you cut know, yourself down and you... Court, down, Courtney's yeah. been in a lot of bands in her time. So she's ah, a right. kick-ass bass player. So. But yeah, but hopefully you haven't had alcoholic roadies. Oh, almost uh, six and a half years. Mm. Yeah. So okay. yeah. So which... How, I mean... A chair, <laughs> yeah. To a chair. Yeah, yeah, because the the out loadout was about 25, 30 feet up in the air. You know. hmm. Yeah, so um, the stones was sadly bad for me. That they mm. had a seven and a half ton truck full of booze just to oh. uh, supply their dressing room. Oh dear. Yeah, and I tried to drink it all myself. I think it was just yeah. So. I guess the, it was the era of excess, and these bands had money coming out of their ears. And well, the I don't know how Keith Richards is still even. I mean, he's he's partied a lot. Well, he was yeah. pickled and preserved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so friend um, Bruce McCaskill took me under his wing, and yeah, and you, so you, you ended up uh, for a long. time period working with Wishbone Ash, along with some of our friends from the Rowdies, uh, like yeah, Mike Hoff, Mark, Mark and Mal and others. Granny. And granny. Yeah, oh yeah. And granny, yeah. the rock and roll Rowdies. So uh, I guess you had much fonder memories of those times, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they were they were good. They were really good. I, uh, I felt confident, like Mal and Neil did when I saw them. In uh, NEMS, you know, uh, yeah, they were, they were, they were fabulous years, fabulous. Yeah, and you were probably then much more experienced as a roadie on and on the road. And well, I was. You see, the thing is, I after the Stones, I, it's when I realised I wasn't, I wasn't a roadie. Now, uh, what you got to understand is with Derek and the Dominoes, Bruce McCaskill, very clever man. Um, he wanted 
somebody on the road to do the baggage for the band, right? Yeah. So I ended up traveling with the band. Now, because I knew the band and the band knew uh. me, I was a perfect choice. So what would happen is I would I was basically drum roadie for Jim Gordon, right? And they had a couple of American roadies as well, so working with bands. So I would travel with the band doing the baggage, get to the hotel, check them in, make sure they were all right. Then I would go down to the gig and do my bit. And so, so I was kind of lucky in that way. So, and that's when I realized, I don't, not too sure if I really want to be a roadie. And then, but I always wanted to go on the road with Wishbone. Even mm. when I was working for the Beatles, I wanted to be on the road with Wishbone. Right, uh, which, is, which is weird because they were poverty stricken. I, um, it was weird working with the biggest band in the world, but wanting to be with the newest, the smallest. Yeah, it, it was a bit of a mind fuck, but you know, that's it that's is, how it was. And so it's kind of weird, yeah. But I mean, I guess it was the the thing about what you were saying around not wanting to be a roadie, but wanting to work with a band, I guess the Beatles experience was perfect for that because you knew how to work with the biggest band in the world on a personal level to yeah. look after them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was that was invaluable. That really was. And so, fortunately, uh, at one point, the band could eventually afford a tour manager. Right? They had Hobbit and... There was Nicky Bell and I think somebody else. Uh, oh, oh, CJ, Christopher Runciman. That was the Wishbone crew. Yeah. And then they would drive themselves. But I would, always knew I was going to work with them at some point. And they always wanted me to work, go on, work with them as well. So it was just a matter of time for when they could afford a tour manager. Mm. Um, that's, I, I started in whenever it was. 72 or something just yeah. you know um yeah. 70s, yeah. so so sorry kevin to interrupt you but uh, thank you to our great friend salty traveling sea my big buddy uh for the 99 cent super sticker which apparently is a hot dog with ketchup although i can't see it uh and so we have to play a suitable um video for salty The magnificence that is the Ruttles uh, and the other rooftop gig. Uh, yeah, so Kevin, you really had some good times with Wishbone and Ash, but I think in the interim as well, or just before that, you'd done this, um, what, the first ever big charity rock gig. Yeah. A concert for Bangladesh, of which I've got the original vinyl for you, <laughs> box set. Um that must have been a hell of an experience too. Two nights at Madison Square Garden with all these uh, a lot of attention. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was. It was amazing. Mal rang me up and said, "Hey, we're doing a charity. George is doing a charity gig in New York. Do you want to come and uh, do the gear?" Uh, I said, "Yeah, of course, of course." And uh, so the Bad Fingers roadie. Um, oh God, I wish I remember his name. Bless him. Uh, yeah, we did it together. Me and, me and just the two of you, yeah, did all the gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it's it's gone down in history because it was really that the forerunner. I mean, a lot of lessons were learned doing this for Live Aid later, much later. Um, all the stars appeared okay, but then all the money got tied up in rights issues for years before it got released. But George did end, end up in the end raising quite a few millions. Yeah, I, I think all of that delay was Klein, to be honest. Yeah. You know, less said about him, the better. Yeah, Alan Klein, indeed. Uh, but, yeah, it's quite a, a, a historical event, and I guess uh, Madison Square Garden would have been a, a pretty special uh, couple of gigs those two nights. Yeah, it was. I, in, in, I'll tell you, in, uh, in those days, you could um, fly equipment around as um, excess baggage, uh, oh right, yeah, yeah. Which is what I ended up doing on my ever first flight, 
was with Derek and the Dominoes to Nice and all of this gear, right, an excess baggage. Uh, but with this one, I took Ringo's drum kit over. Uh, you, you can't do that anymore? No. No. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, the most, loop. <laughs> you know, we used to fly amps back line as excess baggage. You know, <laughs> no, they, no, they stopped all of that. But I arrived, rent it, yeah. I arrived in New York with Ringo's drum kit. And I can't remember what hotel we stayed at. But that, we put the drum kit in the closet, right? Now, with Derek and the Dominoes, my jeans were ripped. So one of the girls that was like hanging around with the band at the time said, American girl said, oh, I'll put a patch on that. She put a fucking American flag on my truck, <laughs> right? Which I didn't think anything of, yeah. right? Which I didn't think anything of, right? Hmm. Now I'm walking around this posh hotel with an American flag on my crutch and my jeans. <laughs> and I got a call from the manager saying, sorry, we're gonna have to ask you to leave. And I said, why? Well, that's offensive. Well, what, was, what was offensive, the flag or the crotch? The flag, where, where, the, where it was. It was where the flag was, uh, yes. uh, uh, right? You know, um, it's, so I went, uh, oh God, I was all, I was just, so I did my mal. You know, which is, I do apologize. You know, I didn't realize it was causing offense. Mm. I'll sort it out. Because what I imagined was, I'm going to be sitting outside this hotel, and it went through my head. I'm going to be sitting outside this hotel with Ringo's drum kit on the sidewalk. <laughs> it was like, mm. oh, for fuck's sake. So I got some gaffer. And I just covered it up with gaffer tape. Gaffer tape, yeah, or duct tape, as some would call it, yeah. Concert for Bangladesh, there's a few shots of me on stage. And what you'll see is a load of gaffer on my crotch. Well, that's <laughs> in an American flag. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if they would have found it more offensive if you hadn't had a flag sewn in your crotch and just had it broken, you know, just ripped. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that would have been all right. Yeah, but that's, I'm going to see if I'd known those photographs existed of that, I would have gone and looked for one. So I'm going to do it for next time. Yeah, yeah no, I've, I've seen it sort of. Uh, yeah. Roadies, <laughs> eh? Roadies. Put, put tape on anything. Uh, but yeah, that was quite a, quite a thing to be involved with, and and it did uh, they did learn a lot of lessons for the much later Live Aid experience. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, had, I had a good time there. That, yeah, but yeah, yeah, you've you've oh. done. Uh, now we're going to run out of time eventually in the show, unfortunately, and I know it's getting late for you, sir. Uh, okay, I think I've woken up. I've woken up. What is the time then? Uh, well, it's probably near midnight for you, but um, Jeez, we've only been going an hour and forty-five minutes, man. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so no. uh, one thing you did do with Wishbone Ash, I think you would be involved in this, was things like Reading Festival. Oh yeah. Yeah, big open air festival in Britain for many years. A lot, yeah. usually a lot of rock, heavy rock stuff. Yeah, uh, that must have been a bit of fun. Yeah, I mean, yet again, you know, we were at the height, you know, of or near enough the height of you know those days. And yeah, it was, it was yeah. amazing. And I, I was negative three. Sorry, it's seventy five. Is that what it says? Yeah, Reading Rock seventy five. Yeah, I guess I was negative pro- three. You were negative three. You were ne- <laughs> negative three. I was twelve. I was twelve. I, I wasn't quite here. going to these. Uh, Fifteen pence to buy the program. I noticed. Twenty five. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, we got another uh, super chat from our great friend Christian Delorme. Two dollar fifty Canadian. Uh, could I, I see Courtney do Joan Jet? Okay. Well, look at the private uh, chat. I can get that there for you. All right. What's in the private chat? It's the short. That's what he. <laughs> uh, oh, right. The price. Sorry. Yeah, you're looking for the right. Well, we'll do that. Hang on a second, then. So let me just. Um... You have to forgive me, but. Uh, I... Oh yeah. Let me. Uh... You won't hear that, will you? I, hear it. I heard it. She obviously Thank doesn't you. give a damn about her reputation, though. I don't give a damn about how I'm dancing either, do I? Look, this is our <laughs> good friend that very well, but... <laughs> I 
that's the end. It's just going to repeat. So, yes, Kevin, that is our great friend Courtney underneath us. Actually, at the, uh, underneath, you can't see me right now, but yes. If we could take that chat off, that was Courtney doing Bad Reputation, Joan Jett songs. So. A couple of weeks oh. ago. So, yeah, cool stuff. Thank you, Christian. Appreciate that. I'm going to get that properly downloaded as a clip. But yeah, Reading Festival. I guess you did all the big festivals. Yes. Of these. Yeah. Yeah. All of them. All yeah. of them. Yeah. And were they were they chaotic, chaotic as a roadie, or were they pretty well I organized? I was a tour manager. I was not a roadie anymore. Oh, you were tour managing by now. Yeah. I finished roadieing with the Stones. Right. So it was tour yeah, managing. I had tour management. Cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, must have been a bit of a logistical challenge to go into some of these big multi-act festivals, I would have thought. No, no, uh, because, no, you turn up. Yeah. You hope that the crew have, have set up properly, which they normally had. There's no reason why they shouldn't. You know, the, the worst thing that could happen is that you go on stage late because a technical switch or right. something happened earlier. Sure. But you know, you you've got your dressing room. It's regardless of what the gig is, you have a pattern. You turn up, you make sure everything's all right, you make sure the band are happy, you do the gig, and you go home. That's what it's all about. You know, it's you see, with a with a festival, you don't do any organizing. Mm. Except you the, just book, the band is booked and they do the it. Yeah. Booked, you know, as long as you arrange the transport, which is your job, you know, as long as you get the band there on time and in good fettle, you know, that's that's it. You get them on stage. Yeah. You make sure that they're all right on stage. They can do. I, their can piece. I ask a question about that? <clears throat> yeah. Like about so when you're a tour manager, um, like I. I I've worked on both sides, you know, like playing. And also I was like uh, a hospitality girl is what they called it. Um, did they have like people like that that would set up the green room and everything already when you're at festivals or did they have those at all the shows? Did you have to organize that type of thing as a tour manager or would that be like uh, the venue? We'll put it like this. If they've got the rider, it should all be done. Okay. So it's the venues. Yes. Yeah. Responsibility. Okay. You have to give the rider. Promoter, yeah. Yes. It promotes his responsibility. I just wondered if it was different, you know, back with... You know, well, you know, you, you do, put it like this, you do know that festivals are kind of slightly more primitive than a tour. I don't you know. know with a tour, you just have one promoter. He knows what you want every single night. With a festival, uh, you hope that they put their rider, your rider correct, what you yeah. want. You know, sometimes at a festival, it's not always possible because... It's a festival. In those days, these days it's different. These days it's a lot more organised. I, I should imagine. You know, but in the seventies, it was still pretty was, rough. Yeah, it was. Yeah, sometimes it was rough. Certainly, yeah, certainly. But you you live with it. You know, you you live with it. You do what you have to do. Exciting in, though. It must have been an exciting experience for some of these huge. Oh yeah. Events. Yeah. Oh, it's, you know, it's you feel. It's like you feel on top of the world. It's yeah. Oh, look at the lineup on this one. I mean, Hawkwind, oh Doctor Feelgood, UFO, yeah. Judas Priest at the bottom of the bill on that day. Yeah. Uh, yes, Super Tramp, Wishbone Ash, Lou Reed. Lou Reed. Now that's the Star Trucking lineup on the third day. I think a lot of it. Yeah, it must be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lou Reed, Manavishnu, Soft Machine yeah, Caravan. Got yeah, Soft Machine Caravan. They should, I should have been um, I can see a Turner there as well. Yeah, I think they took over from Lou Reed uh, at some point. Oh, wow. Uh, on that Star Trek in which you did. And Thin Lizzy are on the bill on the second day. And the Alberto Elos Trios Paranoias. I love that band. Uh, she yeah. was born in a different decade. Yeah, so you did this. Uh, <laughs> on, that, sorry. Was, on that, I was stage manager on uh, Star Trek. All right, and I'm trying to find the poster I had for it. Forgive me, I don't have it to... to. Yeah, so Star Trek was like a big multi-band... Yeah, tour. Tour uh, with... with uh, yeah, had all these different bands in it. So Wishbone Ash were the headliners. Yeah. Uh, that must have been a lot of fun too. Um, well, being a stage manager on that, um, 
we started up in uh, Scandinavia and I uh, damaged my right ankle seriously, mm. uh, nearly falling down some stairs. So on that tour, most of the time, or near enough for all of it, I was on um, walking stick. Oh, dear. You know, um, but being a stage manager, you don't carry gear. No, it's, of course not. So, so stage manager doesn't touch gear, really. What a stage manager does, he's a director. Yeah. You know, he's, yeah, he makes sure that things are running smoothly. So these acts, and you, you, you keep your timing. You know, I did lots of stage management gigs over the next 10 years, you know, and that was my first one. Uh, you know, it was, it was a phenomenal tour. It really was. We had some shit going down, you know, uh, and it was great. You know, <laughs> it really was. There's a hell of a lineup when you look at it. I mean, you've got quite a, quite a variety in there. You've got bands like Soft Machine who are pastoral, psychedelic. Uh, Caravan, a really great, I love Caravan, a great uh, prog rock band. Renaissance or folk rock. Climax Blues Band are really funky. Oh, they were a phenomenal band. Yeah, so into yeah. you and stuff like that. Yeah, what a lineup. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a Sharabang. You know, that yeah. was Miles Copeland's idea. You know, I, I believe uh, he lost so much money on this tour that he went bankrupt. But <laughs> right. yeah. I love that artwork. I would, like, die for a print of that. You know what well, I mean? You that can buy that so poster. Cool. Yeah, you can buy these posters. But that you Star Trek and logo is just great. The, 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 the astronaut. Yeah, it's so yeah cool. no, it was, um, it, it, was, it was really good fun. It, oh, uh, yeah. Considering all the crap that went down and the festivals that we played, Mm. You know, like Bills and, and God, Bills and was a bitch. Um, is that Harry Crumb's work? It may be a Harry Crumb, you know, it's possible. It looks very similar. Yeah, actually, yeah, it, it does. It does. Uh, imagine does it's not a Harry so Crumb. You imagine it's based on a Harry Crumb. It's, it's, it's a pastiche. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice, though. Yeah. And uh, great lineup. And, and so sort of stage managing that. So, really, you'd seen every aspect of the business by this time. Tour manager, yeah. stage manager, yeah. yeah. Personal manager, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's, Pretty um, cool. I, yeah, I've, I, done, I've done it all, I must admit. Yeah, now we're definitely going to, we're unfortunately going to have to draw a line soon, but I did want to talk, and we've, we've got, hopefully, Kevin, with your your um, forbearance, we'll do, we'll maybe do a round two sometime. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, a couple of um, bands that I know that many of us in this show are interested in that you have worked with. One, of course, is the is Judas Priest. Uh, yeah. 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 Style. Was uh, that was that not a good experience? No. <laughs> no. Rob was a lovely man. Yeah. But the rest of it, no. Okay, Rob's a good. Yeah, good was a good guy. That was what screaming for vengeance. I think era. I think. Um, but you were, were you stage managing that or tour managing? No, I was tour managing. Tour managing, right. Yeah, I was, um, I was basically offered the job uh, to tour manage and the only problem was it was starting the next day. Oh, right, right. And, uh, no time to prep. No time to prep and I was promised that everything was prepped and by fuck was it not. So that was a real <laughs> struggle. <laughs> it was a fucking struggle, to yeah. be honest. It was this just in Europe, uh, Britain and Europe, or yeah, yeah, just Britain and Europe? Yeah, fucking nightmare. Yeah, we promise that it's all set up and ready to go for you. We promise. Yeah, right. well, pinky but, swear, pinky swear. Do you know what the first gig, right? The very first gig, my next night. Nobody had decided. Nobody had booked the stage extension. Oh Jesus! Yeah. So from from the front of the drum riser. To the front of the stage was maybe five feet. And then you've got mm. two feet of monitors. So that leaves it down to three feet. Yeah. There was Sorry. a band that came off that night, I can tell you. Sorry, band, Hello, you've got Paul. to stand. Don't move, whatever you do. Yeah. So they got like <laughs> opening band stage. <laughs> just it was a fucking nightmare. Yeah. That's a so, shame. I, so the next day, I had to just prep the whole fucking tour again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the only reason I did it was because the money was good. I wouldn't. Have, I was kind of semi-retired by then. Right. Well, so I did semi-retired, but you well, know. you'd done a because in between you'd done a lot of what uh, you you described as cabaret stuff, cabaret circuit, 
Um, Look, that was after this. Oh, you decided to, to get out of the rock stuff, I think, a little bit. No, no, it just, it's, Ryan, it just kind of evolves, you know. Yeah. You, you get fucked up with something and then it's like, okay, you know, you, you it, go and do an ordinary job or you try and do an ordinary job and then somebody says, hey, I've got all this money for you if you want a job. And it's like, oh, well, that's five times more that I'm earning now, mm. you know, and I know the job and you go, yeah, okay. And then you just end up in shit. But anyway. And I know you worked with these guys as well. Um, yeah. Motorhead. Uh, yeah, oh, man. man. Around. And he is gone. On the yeah. No Remorse tour. Um, yeah, nine, nine months. Nine quite months. A, quite a haul worldwide. I guess that's worldwide, was it? Yeah, yeah. Even behind the Iron Curtain as it was then. Well, that must have been an experience. Yeah. It, well, it's, yes, yes. But the band were the experience. Yeah. yeah. It, it wasn't but, that I mean, he was a nice guy, right? He wasn't out of control, really. Let me was he? I love yeah, Lenny. That's, that's I love what I've him. heard. You know, I, I I never got to meet him. So many of my friends like met him at the the Rainbow or whatever. He used to sit at the end of the bar in LA. I never got to see him. Oh, I had some great times with them. I, I would some... imagine you'd met Lenny way back in the day, though. I mean, it, way um, back. I mean, well, see, the thing about touring is that you don't kind of meet everybody on a regular basis. You know, it's like Lemmy came to uh, a Wishbone gig once at Hammersmith Odeon, or yeah. the Apocalypse, it's called now. You know, and but yeah, apart from that, no, I hadn't really, didn't really know him at all. You know, it was, it was only when we did this one that uh, I got to know him really, really, really well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous. Does seem like a nice bloke. He always seemed like a nice bloke. I mean, uh, he was. He was. Yeah. He was. He was professional to a T. You know, he had yeah. his problems. We had our um, ups and downs. But yeah, wonderful man. I love him to death. It's, there's, there's not many I can say about that. No, but Lamy, sure. I gotta say, was a joy. That's really nice to hear. Uh, Darius, our great friend and panelist, and I think Darius may have dropped off earlier on. Uh, Apologies, Darius, for not noticing that. Um, Three dollars uh, super sticker of the old um, horns with the sparkles. I'm so, doing it, uh, you just can't see me. Yeah, I and, uh, and you can't see you because of that, but we'll play Darius a little <laughs> clip. So, um, you, Darius. Good lord, man. That was Darius. No, I was that was uh, Saxon, I think. Oh, I was going <laughs> to say, hey, Darius. Darius is, like, that's is, is, great is photo. I don't know that, uh, oh, um, that is a brilliant photo. That is, I think, from that tour, I'm right in saying. But, it could uh, well be with Wurzel. Was what, were the fan, what were the fans like on those metal tours? I mean, did you have Excellent. much interaction? Yeah. Excellent. No, they're, they're all just nice people. Yeah. You know, that's they cool. might where all this fucking you know heavy metal stuff they're nice people they're ordinary people it's well, good to know yeah you know they're just lovely you know they're full of admiration for lemmy oh the aeroplane jesus yeah they're all, uh, yeah you know, um, <laughs> yeah just nice nice people good oh that's good to know mate yeah i mean it's you have had an incredible variety because i know that you've done a lot of tours with um you know, comedians even, and, and you know, yep. uh, Leo Sayer, Tommy Cooper, great, I love Tommy Cooper, great comedian. Oh. Leo Sayer, oh. Hot Chocolate, Britain's really premier um, sort of soul band, if you want to call them that. Um, you know, good stuff like that. And there's, there's will be a different level of energy, but it's still all touring, you know, it's all. Yeah, well, this is, that's, you know, this is, a, this is part of it. It's touring, you know, I, I, I always wanted to just be on the road. I wanted to tour, you know, and it didn't matter to me, you know, what I did, you know, it was part of the tour. I mean, with Steve Harley and Courtney Rabble, I was just the personal, you know, I just looked after the band, you know, and uh, my good friend, Richard Ames was a tour manager. That, I, I mean, that's the album I did with them. Yeah, I know, I found that, and uh, it's a great cover. I hope, did you do the cover? No. Uh, it was. It was at Green Park at <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And um, 
there was her <laughs> and Steve, <laughs> <which doubled her. laughs> and there was this old boy, a homeless, whatever, you know, just in the background. And I had to get rid of this old boy and I'd just like, you know, get him out of the way. So I just gave him a tanner and said, look, you know, can you just, here you go, there's a tanner, go and get some breakfast, you know. No, yeah. I guess, yeah, no, that's, I'm on that album, by the way. Oh, yeah. At the end, the very end, there's two girls talking. Yeah. In a Liverpool accent. Well, that's me and Steve. All oh, right, okay. You're you're impersonating Liverpool girls, okay? Yeah, yeah. 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 Nice. I've met Steve Harley actually in Edinburgh once at the Edinburgh Festival, and had quite a long chat with him. He seemed like a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was all right. It was yeah, it was good, intelligent. You know. Yeah, he's a he's quite an intelligent songwriter. Yeah, and he had a great band at that time. I mean, it was the guys from Pilot yeah. that were in the band, and yeah, Stuart Tosh. Yeah. I think. They were good. It was yeah, it was a good tour. Yeah, Duncan Mackay, who went on to be in 10 CC. Yeah. Yeah, great band. Um, yeah. yeah, so you did work with a huge variety of artists, and I know if, if you if you deemed it deemed us worthy, sir, we would love to have you back to talk about some of those. But unfortunately, we're going to kind of kind of kind of wind down a little bit now. Um, especially bearing in mind you got to get up early in the morning. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, our good friend uh, Tom from Midnight's Edge has just popped into the chat. He had been going to join us because because he and I did some streams on Get Back when it came out, and Tom's a big Beatles fan like me. But uh, his internet was out. But good to see you, Tom. Thank you for swinging by in the chat. Here's a um, question. Here's a question. Have you ever met a little Beatles fan? Uh, yeah, I've met a few people that were quite short. I mean, even my okay. own wife, my, my own wife is only five feet ever, tall. I'm always a big Beatles fan, and I just often wondered what happens to the little Beatles. Fan. <laughs> That's right. Well, maybe Comics Division. This is a, an in joke for us on YouTube. Maybe Comics Division's a little Beatles fan. He's a very small guy. Um, yeah, I mean, what is little? Anything under five feet? I'm sure there's a few. Four, I think four ten. <laughs> four ten. Your wife four, is almost little. She is. Yeah, she's five feet. So you know, she she that was she my was. She, uh, my wife has got lots of stories, and uh, I mean, uh, she she uh, was going to see the Beatles in Montreal in 1964, but her mother wouldn't let her go because she was too young. But she did see the Stones later that year in the forum. So, and her mother let her go to that one. She did. I mean, she let you go to the Stones, but not the Beatles. So that's like I had a supervisor. She won tickets to see the Beatles when they fight when they played in Indianapolis, probably '64 or something like that. Hmm. Um, when they did their big tour, they played here, and uh, she, uh, the one thing I always remember, she was like, "All you could hear is screaming girls and the smell of pee." Smell of pee. Yeah, there wasn't a dry seat in the house, as they said. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like it's the Beatles! Ah, just peeing themselves. Yeah, I uh, couldn't hear the band. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this, um, yeah. So, okay. so yeah, I, mean, I guess everybody's a huge Beatles fan. I know there are people who don't like the Beatles, and that's their prerogative. But I, I, I think they're just lying. I would never. Un I would say to those people, I understand if you don't like the music, but their importance in history is something else, and you can't deny that. So this is what Mark Lewis um, is all about. Hmm. It's it's their importance in the history of who they were and when they, you know, that's his. That's his thing, you yeah. know. That, the, the phenomenon of what was the Beatles, you know. That's why I love Mark because I've seen him do a couple of um, live talks, mm. you know. And yeah, his his knowledge is frightening. It's <laughs> incredible. I just say that I've got them back here, but the the complete Beatles recordings and then the complete Beatles live concerts books that he wrote are just. I think if there's a book that sums up rock history, that Beatles recordings one is is it's like a novel. You're like you're reading a novel that unfolds. It's just incredible. And to think that you were there in the room for several of those albums, my friend, um, I'm I'm still highly impressed by that. Trust me. Um, <laughs> believe me, it was a privilege. It was yeah. I know I'm lucky. I, I do know that, but I was told that as well. Well, you made your contribution too, you know, because, uh, yeah, the lads, the boys were the, the musicians, but they had a tight team around them that they couldn't function uh, without. And without that team, they, they wouldn't have been able to concentrate and focus. So 
you know, yeah. you're, you're a part of history. It's cultural history as well. It's not just rock history. I think when you look at things like like uh, the White Album and Let It Be and Abbey Road, for me, they're they're almost it's twentieth century history. Never mind musical history. You know, it's it's, right. it's a watershed in culture almost. So, but that's yeah, just think of it. So, uh, any uh, anybody on the panel have any last uh, questions for our guest? Do you like how I lined up the photo this time? Justin didn't do it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was I like wondering this. why you were sitting like that. Hang on, Look, hang on. It matches. Well, I need a brown jacket, but I have the red hair. Oh, well, it doesn't work like that. You have to look at the legs underneath. Uh, sorry. <laughs> See, look, look at the legs underneath. See? Oh right, you lined up with yeah. with uh, Kevin's legs. I get it. Yeah. Sorry, yes. I guess, I right. was at the beginning, but he was <laughs> looking. But cold. he didn't. He wasn't witty like me. No, he wasn't doing that. <laughs> you know, I can see why you're doing that, Gordon. <laughs> yeah, I think your hair is. Yeah, your ginger hair is almost as ginger as Kevin's, but nobody's as ginger than Kevin's. I think. Yeah, well, um, my mom was a ginger for real. I'm I'm actually blonde as a kid, so this uh, is not obviously not my hair. Kevin's before. a blonde now. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, what my yeah. mom is. She's like white and blonde. It's really weird. She was a redhead. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, thank you everybody uh, that's been in the chat and watched the show today and seen you all in the chat and you've all been uh, wonderful. I really appreciate you all being here. And uh, those over in Rumble that were watching, I know that um, there was a few over there that are not chatty. They're not as chatty over there, but they watch. Um, which is the important thing. I hope you've all enjoyed it very much. Um, uh, Kevin, I cannot say how much I appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure. Yeah. And as I say, I hope you'll, you'd like to do more with us eventually, either on your own or with, with Hobbit and uh, you know, the Rowdies. But whatever, whatever suits you, sir, we will be here for you if you wish to do something. Give me a shout. Will do, mate. Will do, mate. And um, yeah, and I just want to remind everybody uh, about the wonderful book, which I'm hoping is only part one of the manuscript that you. I know you've written a lot more. Who's the redhead on the roof? Uh, Kevin's tales of his life and times with the Beatles. You can get that on Kindle and Kobo and other services. Is that uh, going to come to Audible by chance? Like um, um, somebody else asked that a few years ago. I've not got any plans. Nobody's ever approached me, so I've, I've, you know, uh, who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'll do an audio recitation of it myself in my Scottish accent, and uh, we'll see if they want to I can use listen it. To when I sleep, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I do make people fall asleep. That's true. Um, but yeah, check that book out, everybody. Uh, it's it's an extremely reasonable price on Kindle. It's well worth the read. Some great photographs in it, some of which I've nicked for today's show. Uh, <laughs> being that's the, the nature of the, the beast. But yeah, uh, if anyone, any of my lovely panelists have got anything they want to plug, just speak up now. Well, check out everybody's channel that's here. That's Wolf and Dustin's Keto Simple channel. It's Courtney's got a great channel. Darius, he's not got so much of a channel, but you'll see him everywhere. Well, it's on vacation. And thank you to Debug for uh, sharing those links, like the link to the book. Yeah, thank you for, for those who have been um, uh, modding today in the chat, Debug and Darius and anyone else I may have missed. Imperatus has a channel too, if you want to have your eardrums bleed with the finest death metal. As, it doesn't make your ears bleed. It makes them happy. <laughs> it makes them happy. Uh, as for me, I will be on Toxic Tuesday, Midnight Sage After Dark tomorrow, and Toxic Tuesday, where we're doing the Chuck Norris movie, The Hitman, with Chuck and a mullet, filmed in filmed in Vancouver as well. That one, and then on Thursday morning on Morning Coffee with Brian on Pop Culture Minefield, I will be talking about the Korean movie The Point Men which is an Afghan war set movie. Uh, and we will be getting some input on the show on video from our great friend of that channel, Fahim Fazil, uh, Afghan-American actor who's 
in that movie. So that's that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, thanks again, Kevin. Appreciate it very much, my friend. Stick around so we can say cheerio after we end the stream uh, offline. And I will now hit that button. Everybody, keep on rocking. Stay well and have a great week. And thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you.